started now. Uh, are there any questions about anything at this point? You want to ask? Oh, oh yeah. sure. Um, so question four. I think it wasn't given K and DX wasn't given, so I wasn't sure. K and what? Uh, DX. Uh, I, I yeah, so I the K, I sent an email about DX. Uh, it, yeah, I guess. I'll have to check what I wrote there, probably 0.01 or something like that. Okay, sure. And then for question three, um, I wasn't sure I was interpreting part B correctly. So when you say that there's two adjacent spatial points can contribute a noise term, does it yeah. mean that only the two adjacent points have noise terms associated? And, and is that like um, proportional to the amount of I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is it just like, is the noise like just by itself, or is it like a portion of some amount based on the adjacent terms? Are they two separate terms as well, or are they, are they drawn yeah. on the same distribution, or are they drawn? Well, you, you, I'll have to check the assignment. I don't remember what I wrote there, but yeah, you, you should assume there's noise that moves particles back and forth between adjacent points that I, I don't remember what I said that would this, it might be a contact potential. So if you remember back to the early lectures, we've talked about versions of these models where we can say, if you put an alanine next to a leucine, that has some contact potential energy. And then a model like this, we may have a set of these potential energies. So contacts of A with A, A with C, A with D, C with D, and so forth. That might be another example of a set of parameters. We've seen parameters in our population genetics models. So if we're looking at things like, uh, let's say, a phylogenetic model, what might some parameters of that be? Well, if we're looking at, let's say, a coalescent model of simulating a population, then some of the things we might care about are mutation rates, population sizes, you may be interested in migration rates between population groups and so forth. 
And there are other examples we haven't really looked into yet in this class. So things like in image analysis, we may be interested in learning about what's called a point spread function, so basically understanding how a particular measurement might distort an image we're seeing. Uh, I guess we've seen models from various other disciplines of biology. Uh, pretty much any model we're going to work with, a, pop, uh, you know, a population dynamics model, like an SIR model, it's going to have some things we need to know. If we're going to either simulate the model or if we're going to optimize relative to that model. And all of that is getting at the motivation for this final part of the class, which is how do we get these parameters? So how do we find out the Ks or the contact energies or the population size or the mutation rates or whatever? So often there are ways to get this without doing any kind of computation. So if we were trying to simulate some enzyme of interest to us, how might we get the parameters for that or some options available to us? Let's say you've got an enzyme in the lab and you care about the kinetics of activity of that enzyme. How might you learn the rate parameters so you can model that? Measure it? Yeah, so you could do experiments and actually measure what you want to know. That's another option. You can look it up, it might be in the literature already, someone else might have measured it. But often we're dealing with situations where we have parameters that we simply don't know and maybe can't measure, at least can't measure directly. It may be that the model readouts we're able to get are too indirect, so maybe we can measure the amount of S and we can measure the amount of P, but we don't know the amount of I and I star, we have no way of measuring that, so we need some way of trying to infer what those might be. And, and that's really where we get into model inference as a computational problem. So trying to figure out what parameters of the model might be consistent with whatever data we can get. So that's the primary thing we're going to be looking at in the last module of the class. So are there any questions about any of this yet? All right, so the main thing I want to go over today is the fact that to a large degree, we actually already know how to solve these problems. So in particular, we've already covered some of the major methods you would use to solve these kinds of model inference problems in other contexts. In particular, a pretty large fraction of what we've covered already this term in, for other applications is relevant to this problem of model inference. So there are really two main paradigms we would use for solving a model inference problem, and one of them is to pose it as an optimization problem. So in posing a model inference problem as an optimization problem, what we would try to do is come up with some function that expresses quality of fit of the model, that is the set of parameters, to the data available to us. So it might be that we have some experimental curves that tell us how much P and how much S we have as a function of time in the system. And then what we want to do is pose some objective function phi of K1, K2, K3, K4, such that phi gives us a measurement of how well the parameters lead to a model that fits the data. So if we plug those parameters into a model, whatever kind we want, how close a fit do we get to the data? And then this becomes an, an optimization problem. So it's the problem of trying to find the minimum value over choices of K1, K2, K3, and K4 of phi of those K values. So once we recognize that, we can apply all of our tools for optimization we learned in the first part of the class, and that's one way you can learn parameters of a model. Does this make sense to everyone? Right. The other main paradigm that is widely used in these kinds of problems is to treat model inference as a sampling problem. So in a sampling version of model inference, essentially what we would try to do is come up with some probability function that expresses how plausible any given set of parameter choices are for the model we're trying to create. 
So in other words, what we would want to do is typically express some probability distribution, and usually this will be expressed in the form of a probability distribution for the data, so whatever data we have available, as a function of or conditional on the model. And here, the model might mean the set of k values, for example, and then the data would be whatever information we had available. So, for example, if we were, let's say, looking again at this biochemistry problem, it might be that the data we have available to us, again, is some set of curves of the amount of S as a function of time and the amount of P as a function of time. And maybe our model would be a stochastic differential equation implementation of this kind of system. And then we could ask, as a function of uh, the parameters that we plug in for our SDs, how plausible is this data set? So how likely is it that we would generate the data we actually see from that model as a function of these PDs? And then we would try to sample over that function to get probability distributions over the model and give us another way of learning a good model as well as some other features like which parameters of the model are very tightly constrained versus not so well constrained, what are some different classes of maybe very distinct <coughs> clusters of models that might fit the data equally plausibly and so forth. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, so what I wanted to do today is go through a, some simple examples of these kinds of techniques to just kind of show you how some of the techniques we've already learned are relevant to this model fitting problem and to refresh everyone's memory for some of these techniques that we've been seeing over the previous weeks that will be relevant again in this model inference context. So what I'll start with is a simple model where, let's say we're interested in some kinetics of a protein folding system. And maybe we've designed some kind of experimental assay in which we have our protein set up so that when it folds, it goes from some disordered state to some very compact state. And let's say when it's in the compact state, it's able to bind to some fluorescent probe that releases a fluorescent signal when it's found. And what we'd like to do is learn a model of kinetics of this folding process. And what I'm going to propose is that the data we are going to look at is something that is going to consist of a time series in which we are producing these proteins and they're folding, and every so often we'll see a fluorescent signal that tells us a protein is folded. And we'll assume that this is giving us a readout uh, where the distance between these is waiting times between folding events. And what we're going to try to do is learn a model of these waiting times. Now often with a system like this, we would start relatively simple and assume, let's say, exponential waiting times, where it's usually pretty easy to learn the parameters. I'll make it a little more complicated and assume that the waiting times between these events are something of the form of a gamma distribution <coughs> with order, uh, see, order one. So then what we would have is that the waiting time distribution would be given by the probability time is equal to some value tau is given by gamma squared tau e to the minus gamma tau, where tau here would be the time that we're interested in. And then this is going to give us, a, as a function of one parameter gamma, a waiting time distribution. And our task here is going to be to take a set of data, which we can assume is in the form of some kind of time series, where we've got the time t0, t1, t2, and so forth, and try to figure out what gamma is, to try to learn the parameter of our model. Does this make sense to everyone? All right, so this is an example of something where we might naturally pose our model as a kind of probability model. And what we would want to do if we're going to solve this then is pick one of these two paradigms. So if you're using the sampling paradigm, you would pretty much need to have a model you can express in terms of a probability function, but you can also do that with optimization. And that's what I'll propose we'll do here. 
We'll look at an optimization version of this kind of probability model, in particular what's called a maximum likelihood version of the data fitting problem. And what that means is that we're going to try to pose what's called a likelihood function, so something that tells us how probable the data is given our model and try to find the model that optimizes for that likelihood function. Does this make sense to our friends? Yeah. So isn't two kind of a version of one? Isn't sampling kind of optimization in a way? Uh, yeah, you, you can sometimes think of optimization as sort of a degenerate case of sampling. So you know, it's sampling a very sharp probability distribution in a sense. But usually with, with optimization, what we would say is that we're trying to learn the best possible set of parameters, the ones that give you the optimal value of the objective function, whereas with sampling, you're trying to learn a probability distribution over parameters. So, any other questions? All right, so what we will typically want to do is start with one of these probability functions, and that's referred to as a likelihood function, so the probability of the data given the model. Very often what we'll want to do is also throw in what's called a prior probability, the probability of the model. I'll generally ignore that for the moment here, but this is often something we want to have, these prior probabilities, which would reflect what you would want to do if you have some reason to believe that particular values of the parameter or parameter set are more intrinsically plausible than others independent of the data available to you. But let's for the moment say that we're trying to solve this kind of model. What we would want to do is come up with our likelihood function. I'll call that L, and L would be a function of the parameter we're trying to optimize. And what we want to do is express in terms of this waiting time distribution, which is the model that we're trying to fit, how likely is it we get a particular distribution of these times of events. Now the way I pose that, we pretty much know what the probability is for any given waiting time. So we've got a waiting time t between t1 and t0, a waiting time between t2 and t1, and so forth. And so what we're going to end up with is something of the form of a product over each of these waiting times. So let's say i equals 1 to n of the probability of each individual waiting time. And given that we've assumed that this is the form of our probability distribution, that's going to look something like lambda squared ti minus ti minus 1 e to the minus lambda ti minus ti minus 1. And that then is going to give us a statement of what the probability is that we get this complete sequence of waiting times given our model and given the value of the parameter that we're plugging into the model. So does that make sense? So if we were dealing with a prior probability, then we would assume that we've got something else, let's call it f of lambda, that would reflect how good we think a particular lambda is. So maybe we have reason to believe lambda is approximately 1, so we set up a prior probability where lambda is close to 1, have high weight, lambda is farther away, have lower weight. And if you did that, then what you'd basically end up with is just multiplying this whole thing by f of lambda. But as I say, to, the, to keep things a little simpler in this example, I'll just assume for the most part that we're ignoring that, and I'll just mention whatever comes into things as it comes up. So let's say then that we've posed this as our likelihood, though, without this f. So what we now want to do is, assuming we have the data, so these ti values are known to us, we want to find the maximum likelihood model. So we want to find the maximum of the possible values of lambda of L of lambda. So how would we pose that mathematically? What would we do to find the best lambda? Yeah, so look for where that goes to zero. In these probability functions, there's often one thing you want to do before you do that. And that is, it will often end up that you've got these products over many uh, terms, because you're basically uh, almost always you're multiplying across many data points. Usually when you're optimizing, 
for a probability function, it's going to end up being easier to work with the log of the likelihood. So in this case, we'll just do that as a first step. And if we take the log likelihood, what this is going to turn into is, let's see, this will turn into 2n log lambda minus sum i equals 1 to n lambda ti minus ti minus 1 squared. If we had this f of lambda here, that would just add in as a term plus log of f of lambda. And then we would want to find a zero of the derivative of this thing. So we would take the derivative of p log l d lambda. And if we do that, what we're going to end up with is that this becomes 2n over lambda minus sum um, equals 1 to n, ti minus ti minus 1 squared. So that then is our log probability function. And in this case, we don't even really need to optimize. We could just solve analytically for where this is equal to 0. So for this particular kind of probability distribution, it's got a simple closed form expression that lambda equals 2n over some ti minus ti minus 1 squared. <clears throat> but of course, that wouldn't be true if we threw in some general f here. So if we wanted to take this f added into this, so if we assumed a prior probability, then of course we'd have to add in the derivative of log of f of n, which would come out to df d lambda over f of lambda, and then <coughs> depending on what f is, we might not be able to solve analytically. But basically, what we would end up with is something where if we could find that zero, we could solve for the function. Now, let's say we ended up in the situation where we had a complicated f, and we couldn't solve analytically for the system. What could we do then? So let's say we're at this step, we've taken the derivative, we've got some function here, let's call this I don't know, L prime of lambda. And let's say L prime of lambda is just something really complicated. So we can't find where this goes to zero. What do we do? Call the Yeah, you could use yeah, you could use Newton Maxson or bisection. Basically, you've got, at that point, a zero-finding problem. And you can use all of our usual techniques for the zero-finding. You want to know where L prime of lambda is equal to zero. So the way we would do that if we were using Newton Maxson would be that we would try to take the second derivative of this, L double prime of lambda. And then we would come up with our iterator formula. Lambda n plus 1 gets lambda n minus this would be L double prime over L prime. And that would give us a, an iterator function where we can plug in current value of lambda, get an improved lambda, and starting from some initial guess, we would come up, we would have an iterative method for finding the best possible lambda for a system like this. All right, and this method, of course, would generalize pretty easily to a more complicated f, so we'd have to take the second derivative, or to take one more derivative of this thing, we'd plug that into the numerator here, add the first derivative of f with respect to lambda into the denominator, and we would end up with an iterative formula that would cover the case where we had some kind of complicated prior distribution. Yeah? Could you also do something uh, like gradient descent, co climbing? Uh, yeah, so in this case, if we're looking at just a, a, a problem of one variable, we would probably stick with something simpler. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that we wanted to consider a more complicated model here. So maybe we're assuming that it's got this, maybe we assume that the folding takes two different steps, and there's one step that follows this gamma function, and maybe there's another one that follows, uh, you know, e to the minus lambda 2t. So there's maybe an exponential event. So 
that might occur if we assume that the folding itself is gamma distributed, the binding to the fluorescent probe is exponentially distributed, then you would end up with some kind of likelihood function of gamma 1 and gamma 2. And that's a case where we might need a somewhat more sophisticated method like the steepest descent. So if we were trying to solve this by steepest descent, let's say we derive now that more complicated function that's now a function of two lambda parameters, how would we solve for that? Of course, we'd have to pose the problem, but if we could get to this point that we had a statement for this thing that would tell us how likely our set of t-values is for any given set of lambda parameters, if we wanted to do a steepest descent iterator, the thing we would generally need is the gradient. So we'd need to be able to figure out the gradient of L. And what is the gradient? Uh, how is that defined? Well, the gradient is the vector of the first partial derivatives. So we have dl in lambda 1, dl in lambda 2. So that would tell us for any, if we plug in any given value of lambda 1, lambda 2, each of these, then we would have the gradient of the function for those values of lambda 1, lambda 2. And what would we do then to use this in a steepest descent optimizer? Let's say we had some initial guess of lambda 1 and lambda 2. What do you do once you get the gradient? Yeah, so you would typically try to figure out how far along the gradient you want to move to optimize relative to that particular gradient direction. So you'd say if we were in, say, some lambda 1, lambda 2 plane, essentially what we would do is we'd be looking at our current point. We would have our gradient, which would be a vector. And delta L evaluated that lambda 1, lambda 2. And then what we would be asking is, what's the best value we can find along this vector from our initial lambda 1, lambda 2 point. We would pose that as a one-dimensional zero binding problem. So we're solving optim we're trying to optimize relative to distance along this one-dimensional vector. And then we would solve that by, let's say, a newton raphson method, get some new optimum. And then we would evaluate the gradient again. Maybe the gradient goes this way, so now we're evaluating along this line, and keep repeating that. And eventually, you would hope that this would converge on at least some locally optimal solution. So, does this sound familiar to everyone? Okay, so that basically is showing an example of how we can pose an optimization problem that would solve for uh, at least some kind of parameter fitting, so a simple version of parameter fitting. There are also other methods we've seen that could be relevant to some of the kinds of parameter fitting uh, instances we want to come up with. And in some cases, parameter fitting will turn into an example of a constrained optimization. So if we're talking about constrained optimization, let me come up with another example of a problem that we might want to solve that could be put into this format. So what I'll look at here is a, let's suppose we're doing a simple, exa uh, a simple model of bacterial chemotaxis. So bacterial chemotaxis is a mechanism by which bacteria will head along some kind of chemical gradient. So let's say a bacterium is trying to get to a food source. Many of them have a kind of simple mechanism they use to try to get them to the food source. So instead of doing what you, you might think would be the most obvious thing, let's say we've got a lot of food here, and then kind of the gradient of it gets weaker as you go away, 
you might think that the bacteria would just sort of directly follow the gradient, like that, say, a higher organism might, so kind of sniff where the things are getting stronger and then move along that direction. But bacteria tend to have more limited um, sensing capability and more limited intelligence, in a sense. So what they would typically do is use a mechanism that works as follows. So the bacteria will have a flagellum that propels them. And the flagellum has the interesting property that if it spins in one direction, it pushes the bacterium forward. But if it spins in the other direction, it kind of unfolds and the bacterium starts doing what's called tumbling. It just starts spinning around randomly. And Bacteria are able to locate a food source or follow a chemical gradient by using those two operations. So basically, go forward or randomly tumble. And the way they do this is that they can pretty much control whether or not they're tumbling, whether or not they switch from moving to tumbling based on whether they're following the gradient they want to follow. So if you're going the right way and you're, you're getting a stronger and stronger signal, the bacterium wants to keep going that way, but if it's going the wrong way, then it wants to tumble and basically just pick a random new direction and try again. So that's basically a kind of quick description of what this mechanism is, and then we need a, a model to describe this, and then we'll want to see how we might fit that model. So let's suppose the data available to us is, we'll assume some discretized data in which we've got our bacterial system kind of represented as a set of grid points, and we're assuming that we're watching the bacteria moving between different grid points. And I'll make it a little simpler by just assuming it's actually a one-dimensional grid. So all we're really going to be looking at is, on consecutive steps, is the bacteria moving left or is it moving right? And what we'll want to do is figure out how often the bacterium is tumbling, so learn a kind of simple model of that, just based on how often does it do the same thing twice in a row, and how often does it go one way on one step and then a different way on the other step. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, so I'm going to assume then that the raw data we actually get to look at will be data of that form. So we'll see that on some pairs of time steps, the bacterium is moving in the plus direction at the beginning of the step and plus direction on the next step. And then we would say that we have n plus plus examples of that. And we'll have n plus minus examples where the bacterium is moving right on one step and left on the next step and n minus plus, where it's going left, then right, and n minus minus, where it's going left, then left. And that, we'll assume, is the data we're trying to learn from. And what I'll propose as the model we're trying to learn is that the bacterium on each step either tumbles or doesn't. And I'm going to assume it's got a probability, let's say, Q plus of tumbling if it's going in the plus direction, and Q minus of tumbling if it's going in the minus direction. And then after tumbling, I'm going to assume that it's got a probability P plus of picking the plus direction and P minus of picking the minus direction. So if we propose that, then what we can say is that the probability the bacterium decides to go in the plus direction given that it was going in the plus direction on the previous step, we can derive from this probability model. So if it was going in the plus direction on the prior step, then there are two ways it can be going in the plus direction on the next step. Either it tumbled with probability Q plus, and then just randomly picked the plus direction again, or it didn't tumble with probability 1 minus Q plus. So that then would be the probability we should see a pair of pluses in a row. And we can similarly say that the probability we see a pair of minuses in a row is the probability it tumbled while going in the minus direction and then just randomly picked minus as its next step, plus the probability it didn't tumble. 
and then the probability it tumbled given, or it, it, the probability it's going in the plus direction on one step given that it was going in the minus on the previous step would then be given by the probability that it tumbled while, while going in the minus direction and then randomly pick the plus direction to proceed. And similarly, probability of minus given plus is the probability it tumbled while going in the plus direction and randomly pick the minus direction as its next step. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, so what we've got here is basically then a model that tells us how probable any given pair of steps is. And there are different ways we could pose this as an optimization problem. We could pose a maximum likelihood problem like we did before. And in a maximum likelihood version of this problem, what we would say is we've got particular probabilities of any given pair of events. We've got counts of how often we say we've seen these events in our data. And we could actually pose this as a maximum likelihood problem relatively simply by saying that the likelihood of our model consists of Q plus, Q minus, P plus, and P minus would be given by the probability we see a plus plus to the power of the number of plus pluses we have times the probability we see a plus minus to the power of the number of plus minuses times the probability we see a minus plus to the power of the minus pluses times the probability we see a minus minus to the power of the number of minus minuses. So that would be the likelihood of the model if we're posing this as a maximum likelihood model. I'll propose instead that we'll use a somewhat different model, though. And that would be another common way of posing these sorts of model inference problems. And that's called a least squares model. So we've seen least squares previously when we talked about some linear algebra issues. In a least squares model, what we would say is that we have some observed data. And we can project what our data is given the model. And what we're trying to do is find the model parameters that minimize the sum of square differences between the observed and the simulated data, or the observed and the model data. And in the squares model, we might say that our objective function is some phi of the parameter set, so q plus, q minus, p plus, p minus, where we would pose that by saying that will sum over the different data points, these four different counts here. We'll say we've got, let's say, an, an plus plus observation, and we want to subtract from that the expected number of n plus pluses. Can anyone think of how we would find that expected number? If we have a set of probability parameters, that is, what should n plus plus be? Well, our, what we have here is telling us how often we should see a plus on the second step, given that we had a plus on the first step. That's basically given by this term here. So we can use that as part of our answer. So q plus p plus plus 1 minus q plus. And then what we would want to do is multiply that by the number of times we see a plus on the previous step. So there are n plus 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 n plus minus instances of a plus on the first step. And then that total sum, n plus 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 n plus minus, is the number of times we saw a plus on the first step. And this is telling us what fraction of those should give us an n plus plus. So we just take the difference between those, square it, and that gives us a measure of how good the model is for our data is the number of n plus pluses we see, what we would expect it to be given our parameters, and the number of steps that start with the plus. That makes sense to everyone? OK, so then we can do the same expected number, q minus q minus, plus 1 minus q minus, times n minus plus plus n minus minus squared. 
And similarly, m plus minus minus the probability, excuse me, this, this would be the probability here, q plus p minus times the number of steps to begin with a plus, n plus 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 n plus minus, that squared, and finally, n minus plus minus q minus p plus, n minus plus plus n minus minus squared. Yeah, so that then would give us an objective function, in this case a least squares objective function that would measure quality of fit of our model. So if this function gave us a value of zero, that would mean that our observations exactly fit what we would expect them to be from the model. So by minimizing the value of this objective function, we would get a good value for the model. Does that make sense to everyone? Right, so let's say we pose this as our objective function. How would we solve for that? What algorithms could be used to solve for it? Well, in this case, there's kind of a complication here. And the complication is that our parameters aren't just arbitrary real numbers. Our parameters are probabilities. So what does that impose on our problem? Why is that a complication? Well, the main reason that's a complication is because these have to lie between 0 and 1. So we can't just optimize for this objective function. There are some tricks you can use to switch to other variables that would guarantee a range of 0 and 1. But usually what we would want to say is that we'll throw in some additional constraints. So we'll say that, for example, q plus is between 0 and 1, and p plus is between 0 and 1, and q minus is between 0 and 1. We actually have p plus plus p minus has to add to 1, so we can pretty easily remove one of those variables. But we have to throw in some of these constraints that these have to be restricted to the range of 0 to 1, or else we might end up learning negative probabilities or probabilities greater than 1. So what's the implication of that for how we would solve for this? Yeah, so we would want to pose this as some kind of constrained optimization. So if we just try to use a gradient descent or something like that, we might end up fitting impossible probability parameters. So we would want to pose it as uh, some form of constraint satisfaction problem. In this case, we can know that it's not actually a linear function. So this would be, uh, say, I guess it would end up uh, probably cubic or maybe quartic, some fourth order in the parameters, so it's, it's nonlinear, so you couldn't quite use linear programming, but you could at least treat it with the same kinds of algorithms. So you use a, a barrier method or a, one of the other inferior point kinds of methods we had studied back in, towards the beginning of the class and pose this as a problem you solve subject to those constraints. In this case, I don't think this is a convex optimization, so that might not solve optimally for it. You might get local rather than global optimum, but still it would give you a way of solving this and uh, not having to have risk of violating the constraint side. So does everyone remember what a, uh, let's say, a, a, uh, a barrier method is or what, a, or what an interior point method is? So the interior point method, for those who don't remember, was uh, one of the methods we looked at for solving linear or nonlinear programs. So basically it's just distinguished from a simplex method in that you're searching the interior of the space across the parameters rather than searching along the edges of the simplex. 
any questions about any of that? Okay, so, uh, yeah. Uh, could you modify one of the normal optimization methods and just add some edge case detection so that you don't go over a certain amount? Uh, well, that often doesn't quite work. So it, if you modify it enough, what you end up with is the interior point methods. But basically, you run into problems where if you try to do, let's say, a gradient descent method, the gradient might sort of run you into the barrier and then you just kind of get stuck. You can it's not enough to just say don't go over the barrier because the method's still sort of stuck at that point when you get too close. So that's where the interior point methods do something a little more sophisticated. And there are other kinds of tricks you can use where you know, if you're trying to fit a parameter that you know is between zero and one, then you know, instead of trying to fit the actual value of Q, you would fit, a, let's say, something Q prime, where Q is equal to E to the minus Q prime, or something like that, and then Q prime can range vary over, you know, uh, yeah, I guess that one doesn't really quite work, but, but basically you try to pick a value that you map this range onto the whole real number axis and pick a function that does that and then you can get around um, for these simple kinds of constraints you can get around <coughs> having to use those methods but more complicated kinds of constraints there really isn't a, a, a substitute for them. Any, any other questions? All right, so there are some complications that come up with these kinds of methods, and one of them comes up in the situation we've seen previously with optimization problems, and that is what to do with implicitly specified functions. So let's say we're looking at one of the protein folding examples. So we're looking at a system where maybe we're trying to come up with a protein folding program. So we've got some optimizer that takes you know, an amino acid sequence, let's call it S, and predicts how that should be folded. And maybe we'll assume that this is one of these lattice uh, optimizers that's trying to fold the protein optimally on a lattice, and it has some set of energy parameters, so EAA, EAC, and so forth, that uh, give its estimates for the contact energies between any pairs of amino acids. So what we might do is take some set of examples where we know the correct fold of the protein, so maybe we get a bunch of sequences, S1, S2, S3, and we know the correct fold, C1, C2, C3, and what we'll also do is then take our prediction algorithm and we will plug in some given guess of the parameters. And what our algorithm would give us then would be inferred folds, let's call them C1 hat, C2 hat, C3 hat, and so forth. And what we might do is propose that we're trying to find the optimal set of these parameters to match the actual folds of the protein, the actual conformations with the predicted conformations. So in other words, what we're assuming is that we have some measure of distance between actual and predicted values. So a typical thing to use would be the root mean square deviations, the average distance in atom coordinates. So we can get, let's say, the root mean square deviation between CI and CI hat. And then what we would do is propose that our objective function of these E values, and I'll just abbreviate as a vector E of all these contact potentials, is then maybe the sum over each of these uh, proteins I of the RMST of CI and CI hat. So maybe this is the problem we're trying to solve. And then the parameter inference problem we're proposing is to minimize this over possible values of all of the elements of the vector E, so all, or, or vector E, so that is over all of the contact energies. So in this example, we have a couple of complications, and one of them is that we're assuming that we just have some computer program that tells us what these CI hat values are. It's telling us we put in a protein sequence, and we put in energies, and it folds it, 
And probably what this is doing is complicated enough that we don't have a simple analytical expression for how that works. It's just some algorithm that it's running on it. And even the RMSD itself, that you can come up with analytical expressions, but they're, they're going to be pretty complicated. So the point is that what we're going to end up with here is something we can evaluate, but it's something that we don't have an analytical expression for. So how would we solve for a problem like that? Let's say we wanted to solve this minimization problem, what could we do? Let's say we wanted to solve this by the steepest descent. If you were trying to create a steepest descent solver for this, given that this function is just a computer program, you plug in your E vector, and you plug in your sequence, and it, well, I guess you plug in all the sequences, you plug in your E vector, and it just spits out a number, and that's the quality of fit for that E vector. How would you find the yeah. approximate the derivative? Yeah, so to get a steepest descent method, we need the gradient of phi. So we're trying to get gradient of phi, and the gradient is the set of first partial derivatives. So we need phi d aa contact energy, d phi d ac contact energy, and so forth. And we can find each of these through a numerical approximation, at least we can estimate them. So what might an, a numerical approximation for d phi d e a a look like? Well, what we would typically want to do there is we would take phi and we would plug in the energy function except with a perturbation. So add some delta E to EAA, and then use all the other energies just as they are. We would subtract from that phi with our unperturbed energy vector. We divide it by delta E, and that would give us a first order approximation to the derivative of the contact energy, or the derivative of the RMSD score with respect to that one particular contact energy. And we could do the same thing with all of the others, and so we get a numerical approximation to our gradient. And once we've got a way of estimating our gradient, we have what we need to implement a steepest descent optimizer and try to get the optimal values of our contact energies. Now a problem like this might be such a, a complicated potential function that steepest descent actually wouldn't work very well, but at least in principle, we could get a, a local optimum of our potential function this way. Does that make sense to everyone? So another instance where this very often come up in biological parameter inference problems is that very often what we're trying to do is learn model, learn parameters for a simulation. So if we're looking at one of our biochemical systems, for example, so maybe we're trying to find uh, an optimizer for the system A plus B goes to C with forward rate K1 and reverse rate K2, then probably we would have some simulation model we could develop where we can say as a function of K1 and K2, what do A and B and C look like? And we could say that we've got estimates of these, A hat, B hat, and C hat, that are functions of K1 and K2. And we might assume that we have some actual experimental data. So we would have, let's say, time points where we know the actual value of A, and time points where we know the actual value of B, and the actual value of C, and so forth. And what we want to do is find K1 and K2 to optimize the fit of our simulation to these time points. So how could we do that? 
Yeah, it's basically the, the same thing as before. We would come up with some kind of objective function that would express the quality of fit. So we could say something over each of these time points. So we've got a set of points ti, and we've got a of ti, b of ti, and c of ti at each of these, measured at each of these time points. And then basically you could pose, let's say, at least squares objective. So you can say you're summing over each of these time points. Your simulation, A at time point TI, simulate by, let's say, doing a mass action model, doing numerical integration on that, subtract the measured value at that time point, square this over all of the time points, and then just add in the same thing. So B simulated minus B measured squared and C simulated minus C measured squared. That gives you an objective function. And then, just like in this case, we can get a value out of this. We've got a computer program, so our numerical simulation, that will give us the simulated values. It's pretty easy to turn that into something that will just spit out numbers for our objective function as a function of K1 and K2. And then we can get this phi of k1 and k2, you can get values out of it, so plug in any k1 and k2, and it gives you a value of phi, and then we could get the gradient of that, so get d phi dk1 and d phi dk2. You can evaluate those by numerical derivatives using the same kinds of numerical derivative approximations we used here. And then based on that, we could put together a steepest descent method, or we could get numerical second derivatives, put together a numerical estimate of the Hessian, use a Newton-Raxon uh, method, basically any of the kinds of uh, multi-dimensional optimizations we used before. Yeah? I have two questions. One is, when people like find the distance uh, measurement, why do they use these squares instead of the sum of absolute value for different uh, well, it really, it depends on the model you're using. So in, in some cases, there are some kinds of optimizations where you do use the absolute values. It's, it, you, you'll often hear these in machine learning context referred to as by the, the norms, or either you're optimizing for the L1 norm or the L2 norm. And uh, the L2 norm, so the optimizing the square, it, it, it turns out it's, it's the right thing if you're assuming your noise in your measurements is normally distributed, and many kinds of noise are, so it's, it's not arbitrary that people often use the square there, but it really does depend on your model. Sometimes one, the L1 is the right thing to do, sometimes L2. If you really want to get it right, you have to think in detail about what your model or the, the error and the approximation is. And uh, how often does like, the loss of precision because of floating calculations, how often does that matter? Uh, yeah, it's hard to say. I, I, it certainly can matter. and it, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated question, because if you're using like a, a newton raphson optimizer, then it depends on whether your, uh, if your Hessian is well conditioned. So if you have a badly conditioned Hessian, you can get a pretty large error introduced from that. Whereas uh, other methods, it's not going to matter too much. So steepest descent will generally, I think, be less sensitive to those kinds of things. But always, the you have to be careful in the, the numerical derivative approximations that if your delta E is too small, the numerical error will overwhelm the approximation. So this is too similar to this. So you have to pick an appropriate uh, delta E, and then you know, you're trading off error of the you know, the first order error in delta E against the round off error of delta E is too small. So it, it's not a, a simple question. There are kind of a lot of things to consider. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right, so that basically shows us how some of the kinds of techniques we've used for optimization can be relevant. I do parameter inference using a uh, a model of this as a sampling problem. So with a sampling version of parameter inference, what we're typically trying to do 
is come up with a probability of density over possible models, and then we're trying to estimate what, what's called the posterior. So how, how often would you see each model explaining the data, in a sense? What's the probability distribution over models weighted by consistency with the data? And to take a, an example of that, uh, this is kind of a, an oversimplified example. It would be a little easier than some of the things we would uh, normally deal with. And for the most part, you could probably solve this one analytically. But let's say we are looking at an image. And we're going to assume that this image takes the form of a grid of pixels. And to keep it simple, I'm just going to assume that it's nine pixels. And we're going to assume that we've got some measured intensity at each. So D11, D12, D13, D21, and so forth. And what we're going to assume is that this is really an image of a discrete object. So some of these pixels are over, let's say, a spot on a gel that we're trying to detect. So what we're going to be trying to learn as a model is the discrete object based on the data, which is the noisy image of that object. So in other words, I'm going to assume that we've got real valued intensities of these pixels, but the real system that we think we're looking at is going to look something like this. So we're going to assume that some of these grid points have objects in them, some don't, and then we're trying to figure out this model, so which grid points have objects in them based on the data that we're looking at. All right, so in that sense then, what we would say is that we have a universe of possible models, and the universe of possible models is based on whether we have effectively a zero or a one in each of these nine grid points here. So we've got effectively two to the nine possible models of our system, and we're trying to ask what is the probability distribution over those two to the ninth models given the data set we get to observe. So is the problem clear to our friend? All right, so what I'm going to pose then is, let's just say for the sake of argument that we have a model that the value of a particular observation depends probabilistically on whether or not there is a, an object in that grid point. I'm going to say that it just happens to have the probability distribution of a normal equal to whether or not there's an object in the grid point with, let's say, uh, variance one, and then we'll square that because uh, pixel intensities have to be positive numbers. So in other words, if this is an empty grid point, then we would say that the distribution of possible uh, intensities is equivalent to a normal with mean zero and variance one squared. And if the, the grid point is occupied, so it has a value of one, then the intensity of the pixel we're going to be assume is distributed as a normal with mean one and variance one squared. Yes. Are you saying that that's what we expect the noise to be? Yeah, so for anything like this, we have to have a model of the noise. You can also learn parameters of the noise model while you're doing this, but you always have to have some way of specifying a probability distribution over your universe of possible models. And this is basically giving a probability distribution for one pixel at a time, and then the probability for the whole model would be basically the product over pixels of this thing. Does that uh, clear things up? All right, so if we were just trying to get then the probability of the data given the model, so here is the data, here is the possible model, then we can figure that out pretty much by just taking a product over the different pixels. So we get a gamma i equals one to three, gamma j equals one to three over the possible pixels in our coordinate of essentially this thing. So probability dij is equal to that, which would be equivalent to mij plus a normal zero one squared. 
that would be basically our likelihood function for the data given the model. And just to make it a little more interesting, I'll propose that we have a prior probability on possible models. So we'll assume that we know that there are some, some numbers of spots more likely than others. And what I'll just say is we'll propose that we've got a prior probability, probability of the model is equal to a binomial with parameters a uh, number of grid points, 9, and some probability p. So in other words, we're saying that we expect, on average, we have a p fraction of the grid points occupied, and then we'll penalize models that have too many occupied, we'll reward models that have about the right amount of occupied. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, so Basically, what we would then end up with is we've got the probability of the data given the model, the probability of the model, and what we would really want to sample over is the probability of the data given the model times the prior probability of the model. And it's worth pointing out that we would usually look at this even though what we really care about is the probability of the model given the data. In some sense, this is the thing we really want to know. And the reason we can do this is because basically these are related by the rules of conditional probability or basis rule. So uh, essentially, these things are more or less equivalent. If you can get this thing, you're getting this thing modulo a scaling factor, and then the scaling factor just kind of comes out automatically, so sort of estimate that in the process of sampling. So pretty much, that's just worth saying, really you want to find the best model given your data, but it's about the same thing to get the, be to get the model such that the likelihood of the data is optimized rather than the opposite. Find what you want, probably the data? Uh, well, we don't exactly ignore it. It's, a, it's generally a hard thing to, to estimate but you know it's going to be the thing that normalizes all of your sampling to make it into a probability distribution. So basically, in, in the end, if you run a sampler over this distribution, whatever you need to divide by to get, it, to get everything to add to one, that ends up being your estimate of probability of T. So you kind of don't need to know it explicitly. So any questions about that? All right, so putting all of this together then, what we have basically is a model of the likelihood of a given set of data. And we could, in principle, take any particular possible model. So I said we had two to the ninth possible models. It's not that many. We could actually run through this and try every possible model. But let's just say for the sake of argument that maybe instead of a grid point of nine pixels, you're looking at a grid point of a thousand by a thousand pixels. So that's not possible. What we want to do though is run through this and come up with at least some estimate of the high frequency points here. So the well sample points of this probability density function. So how might we do that? How could we come up with something that would sample over a probability density like this? What techniques do we have for sampling from complicated probability densities? Well, the main method we had seen, or really class of methods, was Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. So we would set up a Markov chain where the states were possible models, and then we get an estimate of the likelihood of each state in that Markov chain. So try to find the stationary distribution of the Markov chain, setting it up so that its stationary distribution will be the likelihood we're trying to sample. So what MCMC techniques did we see? Is Gibbs sampling one of Yeah, so Gibbs sampling is one of the ones we've seen. We saw one other. Can you remember what that was? Well, important sampling is a technique we would often use to accelerate these kinds of techniques. But there's another basic technique we had seen. 
yeah, Metropolis was the other one we had seen. And pretty much for a system like this, it's about as easy to come up with a Gibbs sampler as a Metropolis sampler. And a lot of the work would really be the same for coming up with one versus the other. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that we had some particular model, so maybe we've got one pixel filled in here, and we've got our data set. If we wanted to come up with an MCMC sampler, the first thing we would want to do is come up with the graph that describes the Markov chain, or so basically figure out the neighbors of any arbitrary state. If we were doing this as a Gibbs sampler, then what we would want to do is describe the model in terms of a set of variables, and then the neighbors of each state would be the things that correspond to changing one variable. And an obvious way to do that is to think of the variables as these m11, m12, m13, and so forth values, these binary values of these states. And then we would end up with a, a, a graph in which the neighbors of any particular state would be the models that differ by flipping one individual pixel. So one neighbor of this model would be the thing we get by turning off the first pixel, and another neighbor would be the thing we get by turning on the second pixel, and so forth. We'd get better where we turn on the third pixel. So basically any two models that differ by a single pixel we would end up having a, a, a neighbor relationship between them. All right, so that then gives us a, a graph that's describing the neighboring relationships. And what we then want to do is figure out how likely we are to take any one neighbor versus any other. So if we were doing a Gibbs sampler, the first thing we would do is pick a variable uniformly at random. So we have nine variables here, so you pick one of those. And then let's say we pick this middle box here as our variable. What do we do next? So what, what would be the usual way you would decide whether or you keep this empty or flip it to uh, fill? Yeah, so we would want to consider the conditional distribution. So let's say we're looking at that, and I'll call this model M and this model M prime. What we're going to want to do is consider the conditional distribution of values of that one pixel, given that we hold all of the other pixels in their current state. So if we wanted to do that, basically what we're asking is, what is the probability that the pixel in this point, so let's call that pixel 2, 2, is on, which we can think of as the probability that the data at that point is drawn from an n11 squared distribution. So that would give us the conditional probability that it takes on, or that would give us the probability that it takes on this value, and we would multiply that by the probability of the prior, so that the binomial 9 comma p distribution takes on the value of two occupied boxes. <coughs> and then we would consider that relative to the other possible values of that variable. So the probability d22 is equal to the n11 squared probability binary or binomial NP equals two plus the probability the pixel is unoccupied, which is the probability the data we get to observe is drawn from an N01 squared probability distribution times the probability that we have one box occupied, which we've assumed has a prior binomial nine comma P equals one. So this then would be the conditional probability that this box is occupied given the current state of all of the other boxes. And then we would just flip this to a zero and this to a one to get the conditional probability you stay in the unoccupied state. Does that make sense to work around? So what if we were considering a metropolis model? 
So let's say that we'll keep the same graph. So we'll assume that the neighbor relationships in our metropolis model are derived by flipping one box from your current state. So how would we then decide, or what would be the method we would use to decide whether or not to take the move in a metropolis model? Let's say we had picked the middle box again, so we were considering whether or not to make this jump from M to M prime. What would we do to figure out whether to take it? For a metropolis model, usually the thing we care about is the likelihood ratio. So we want to know essentially the ratio of stationary probabilities and we don't need to know the scaling factor to figure that out. We just need to know the difference between probability of D given M, probability of M versus probability of D given M prime, probability of M prime. So we would generally try to figure out that ratio. Let's call it R, probability of D given M, probability of M, divided by probability of D given M prime, probability of M prime, and it would end up looking pretty similar to this. So the contributions of all of the pixels except the one we were considering flipping would cancel out because they're going to be the same here and here. So basically what we'll end up with is a ratio of really this term to this term. So essentially the ratio of this to this is going to be our likelihood ratio. And then how do we use that in the metropolis algorithm? Let's say we figured out this ratio. Well, what we would want to do is, if we're considering, let's say, possibly making this jump, either this ratio is going to be greater than one or less than one. So if the ratio is greater than one, what do we do? Well, in this case, I, I guess I post it kind of the inverse of the way we usually see it. So if the ratio is greater than one, then this will become really one over the probability we jump. And if the ratio is less than one, then we automatically jump because it means the new model has higher likelihood than the old model. So in a metropolis model, essentially what you're doing is using this ratio to decide whether or not to jump. So you know, it might have been better if I had written the inverse of this. So probability of D given M prime, probability of M prime over probability of D given M, probability of M. And then if this is greater than one, you jump. If it's less than one, it's the probability you jump. Does that make sense to everyone? OK, so as with our other methods, we could get quite a bit more involved here. So we can use variants of Gibbs sampling, metropolis sampling for continuous parameters. So here I presented it with discrete models, but of course those generalize to continuous models. We could bring in important sampling if we wanted to have a way of optimizing this more efficiently for more complicated kinds of systems or for hard to optimize uh, likelihood functions. But basically the key point here is that the techniques we've already learned earlier for sampling from probability distributions or for optimizing systems give us a lot of the tools we're going to need for fitting models to, or parameters to a model, or for learning models in general. So any questions about that? All right, so there are some alternatives to these methods. There are ways of doing parameter learning that aren't optimization or, uh, or uh, sampling. Uh, we'll be having a guest lecture on Thursday. I, I, I'm, I don't think it, it, well, I'm not 100% sure what he'll be talking about. He may be talking about some of the alternatives to these kinds of methods, so other more advanced methods. But basically, uh, I think it, it should be good material for learning about some of the alternatives. And then later in the term, I want to get into some more specialized methods uh, that are used specifically for parameter learning problems and how we apply them to some uh, particular kinds of hard parameter learning problems. Uh, I will just say for Thursday, so your guest lecturer is coming a little late. Please don't leave. Plan to be here. It's uh, not going to be good for him if he shows up to an empty room. So please uh, stick around for at least a few minutes.
Uh, I, I think you'll find it very interesting. So the guest lecturer, for those of you who haven't seen it, is Chris Langmead. I think some of you are taking his cell and systems model in class now. Okay, so any questions before we break? Okay, I guess that's it.